There are many religions, and even more gods. They carry names such as Legba, the divine messenger, or Oshun, the goddess of fertility. And all these gods are called upon, worshipped, prayed to, and praised by name. But surprisingly, there is one religion namely Judaism, in which the name of God isn't allowed to be uttered. Since this prohibition has been persistent for approximately 2,000 years and been broadly adopted by the churches of Christendom, a disturbing state has now been reached in which God's name has almost been forgotten and its pronunciation seems uncertain. This movie considers the question of whether the concealment of God's name is actually in harmony with the original scriptures, and furthermore, whether the correct pronunciation of the name can be found again. Yes, he has a name, but I don't recall it right now. Yeah, God. For me, he got kein name. In my opinion, God has no name. Uh, I don't know. Je sais pas. Tolérance. Tolérance. Ein bestimmten Namen, glaube ich. A specific name? I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't think so. But I do believe that there is a God who does everything, but a specific name? Not for me. Hardly anybody suspects that the name of God can be found right here on the church. In the form of these Hebrew letters, the so-called Tetragrammaton. The Orientalist Rolf Furudi gives us a bit more insight on these four cryptic letters. This is the Aleppo Codex, one of the two great manuscripts from which our Old Testaments are translated. In the Hebrew text of the Bible, the tetragram occurs more than 6,000 times, including here in Psalm 130. 5 verse 13. But the four Hebrew letters that originally signified God's name over more than 6,000 times have now been substituted through common titles, such as Lord or God, in present-day Bible translations. Is this text alteration in unison with the Bible's intention? Absolutely not. I would like to read the words of God himself from my personal copy of uh, the Biblia Hebraica from uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 3 and verse 15. First, God says, I am Jehovah your God, the God of your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And then he says, Ze Shemi le olam. This is my name forever. Veze zichri le dor dor. And this is my memory from generation to generation.
In the course of his work, scholar Gérard Gertou came across the name of God and also realized the huge importance of names in general, especially the meaning of the names of gods in ancient times. For example, in the name Tutankhamun, one finds the name of the god Amun. In Nebuchadnezzar, the name of the god Nebu. And in Ramses, the name of the god Ra. Thus, many ancient names contain the name of a god, for in those days people found it unthinkable to not make that reference. This vast appreciation for divine names is displayed in many ancient texts, prayers and scripts. All Muslim surahs, excluding the second and the ninth, commence with, in the name of God. In Christendom, the Lord's Prayer begins with, hallowed be thy name. The Jews say, Kaddish, thereby sanctifying God's name. Paradoxically, the name isn't even used in these religions. This hasn't always been the case, and many of our forefathers firmly believed in honoring and showing respect for the name of God. And in many countries, a form of pronunciation, which is also contained in many inscriptions and songs, prevailed, Jehovah. Nowadays, however, many Christian preachers and evangelists refuse to accept this form of pronunciation. Transliteration from Yeshua. Jehovah is not a transliteration. Jehovah was a name that some white Jews came up with to replace the sacred name Yah because they felt like the name was too sacred and too holy. Others are convinced that the name of God isn't Jah or Jehovah, but rather Jesus. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That name is the name of Jesus. This opinion is widely spread throughout Christendom and has led to the actually unbiblical worship of Jesus instead of Jehovah. The authority of the Tetragrammaton is also doubted due to the opinion that its existence doesn't date back to day one but developed from preliminary stages. Here we see Yod, He, Vav, He. When the, the Jews in the past spoke together, they pronounced the words with uh, consonants and vowels. But in writing, they only use consonants. The name seems to have been used as early as 1400 years before Christ, descending from Egyptian hieroglyphics. The first time we find the name of God is in the Amun temple of the pharaoh Amenophis III in Soleb in Sudan in the 14th century. Here we see the inscription. The two papyrus leaves here are Y. Uh, then the sign is uh, H. And the rope formed as a lasso is W3. And we have the quail chicken again as W. This is a grammatical element of the proper name, so you can simply ignore it. So we read Ta Sharshu, the land of Sharshu of. Jehovah. 
Another meaningful discovery, the so-called Mesha Stele, which belonged to King Mesha of Moab, dates back to the year 890 before our era. Today, it is located in the Louvre in Paris. Var ekach, and I took me sham from there, et keli, the vessels, and then we have yod he vav he in old Hebrew charter or Moabite charter. Va es hov, and I placed hem them, lifnei kemosh, before kemosh. Kemosh was the god of Moab. So I took the vessels of Jehovah and placed them before Kemosh. Here we have the tetragram with four letters. The Mesha Stili is again clear evidence that the name of the Jewish God was even known by Gentiles or non-Jewish nations. We have this inscription from Sudan from the 14th century, the Moabite stone from 890, and these uh, grave inscriptions and letters, and all these are uh, old examples of the tetragram. So we can say that as far back as we have evidence, we find the four letters of the divine name. The fact that the name of God is correctly displayed by these four ancient Hebrew letters is therefore generally indisputable. But how is the name pronounced? Some white Jews came up with to replace the sacred name Yah because they felt like the name was too sacred and too Pastor holy. Pastor Smith has a point. Since Yah is indeed God's name, it is, however, the short version which consists of two Hebrew letters, namely Yod and Hey. The abbreviation Yah, which is found in the word Hallelujah, is mistakenly identified as the first syllable of God's name. That is why many assume that the name Yahweh is justifiable since Yahweh begins with Yah. First of all, we should note that this form is very rare. In the Hebrew Bible, we find this form in the phrase Hallelujah, praise Yah. 20 times and then 19 times standing alone. If we compare these 49 examples with the more than 6,000 examples of the tetragram, we see that this is a rare form and absolutely not an alternative name for Jehovah. In order to find the right answer regarding the correct pronunciation, Jehovah or Yahweh, the last letter seems to be of importance. When Hebrew names end with an H, the H is pronounced as an A. Professor Furudi confirms this. Very often when a Hebrew word ended with the letter He, this letter stood for a vowel, namely long A or long A-E, E. Uh. If the H on the end of Hebrew names sounds like the vowel er, this would indicate that the pronunciation Jehovah is correct and Yahweh isn't. But in the widely distributed Elberfelder Bible, we can read, The Israelites never said Jehovah, but in all likelihood, Yahweh. Later, one did not dare to pronounce God's name, but instead said, Adonai, Lord. In order to actually remember to read Adonai instead of accidentally Yahweh while reading from the Bible, the Jews added the vowels E O A from the word Adonai to the consonants Y H W H of the name Yahweh in their Bible scripts. However, the vowels that derive from the word Adonai aren't A-O-R, but rather R-O-R. This gets even more confusing. 
Wobei das Zeichen für E With the A in place of the A, outsiders must have read Jehova. Consequently, this implies that Jehova isn't a name and should therefore neither be written nor pronounced in our language. Auch nicht so schreiben und aussprechen sollte. This explanation, which is often recorded in books, is wrong and quite easy to set right. The vowels from Adonai are A or A. So if the illiterate reader would have combined A or A with the consonants, he would have had to read Yahowa. But this kind of vowel setting cannot be found anywhere. Nehemiah Gordon, a biblical scholar from Jerusalem, made the same discovery. Well, the interesting thing is, as I was studying, <clears throat> as I was studying and, and reading ancient manuscripts, that's one of the things I did for my master's degree, I was reading the original manuscripts, I saw that they weren't the vowels of Adonai. And in fact, there were, there, now a Hebrew name like yud heh vav -Hey, the father's name, it has to have three vowels, one for each of the, mm -hmm. the pronounced letters, Y-H-V, and the final H is silent in Hebrew, that's normally the case, the final H is silent final hey and so there's supposed to be three vowels there was only two vowels in the manuscripts and I started to think okay well why would they leave out a vowel why would they do that during his continuing research Nehemiah Gordon actually came across the missing vowel so I'm checking the printing against the original manuscript, and I find that there's a place where the vowel isn't missing. And what is the vowel? It's the vowel O. And what that means is that the name is actually to be pronounced Yehovah. Now, In I his fascinating book, sense, Nehemiah Gordon describes how he discovered many more tetragrammatons with the help of a scientific search program, all equipped with the complete set of vowels needed for Jehovah. Yet, down to the present day, people widely hold on to the pronunciation Yahweh and consider Jehovah a reading error. I've talked to specialists and translators who know that this statement is false, but do not want to change it because they're afraid of contradicting their fellow colleagues. But even the scholar Rolf Ferruri speaks out against the form Yahweh. So I'm not aware of any real linguistic evidence in favor of the form Yahweh. To the contrary, there is much evidence that the name of God consisted of three syllables and not two as we have in Yahweh. The Anchor Bible Dictionary, in the discussion of the name of God, says the following. The pronunciation of YHWH as Yahweh is a scholarly guess, and certainly so, it is only a guess. It should be added that notable scholars from previous centuries didn't use Yahweh, but almost exclusively used the name Jehovah or similar linguistic forms of God's name. On the continuous search for the correct pronunciation, one comes across something very obvious, Jewish names. First of all, we should look at the Hebrew Bible. Here we find uh, names, so-called theophoric names. This means that a part of God's name is the fir first part of uh, the proper name or the last part or the next last part. Uh, the first two syllables of many Jewish names were Yeho. We have, for example, Yehoash, Yehonatan, Yehoyada, Yehoyakin, and Jehonadab. 
Nehemiah Gordon shares the same opinion. It makes perfect sense because we have all these names in Hebrew that open up with the word with the phrase Yeho, like Joshua in Hebrew is Yehoshua, which means Yehovah saves. And you have Yehonatan, Jonathan, Ye Yehovah gives, and you have, a, you have dozens of names like this. This is and, just marvelous. And the name yud heh vav of our father opens up with those three letters, and that's essentially an abbreviation of his name. So Yehovah made perfect sense. Well, just as I find this, I'm sitting there minding my All these names create a pattern. The divine name is either placed at the beginning or the end. If it is placed at the beginning, it's always Yeho, abbreviated Yo, without exception. As an ending, it's always the abbreviation Ya, which can be lengthened to Yahu. There is no exception here. The abbreviation of God's name is Yah, the full name is Yehovah. Even in names of places, the initial syllables of the divine name can be found. Since time immemorial, there is this valley below the city wall of Jerusalem, which carries the name Jehoshaphat, Judgment of Jehovah, and has already been mentioned by the prophet Joel. Let the heathen be wakened, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. The most significant evidence regarding the form Jehovah is, however, embodied in the name of an exceptional person, Jesus. Jesus is in the Hebrew Yehoshua, a theophoric name, Yeho first, and the last part of it comes from the verb Yasha, to save. So the name of Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. The exceptional connection between the two names is clearly recognizable, for Jesus incorporates the aspect of salvation through God, whereas the name of God contains nothing more. It is the only name that does not contain any other name. And whose meaning is unique. In a well-known Bible translation, we can read, I shall prove to be what I shall prove to be. This remarkable name was revealed by God himself when being specifically asked about it by Moses. Jehovah and Yehoshua, two names, two personalities. But representatives of the Christian churches find this fact hard to believe. Since to them, only one God exists, who equally embodies the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This concept is a result of the doctrine of the Trinity, which was established by church councils of the antiquity. Gradually, theologians and Bible translators came to realize that to have two names, Jehovah and Jesus, side by side, when there is one God who is triune, would, could cause problems. At a Bible translation convention in Jakarta, Indonesia in the year 1952, translator Rosen explained the following. 
It might be disrespectful and disobedient, therefore, to restore something that God himself has demolished. It might mean that Jehovah would irrevocably become the strange God of the Old Testament and that the cleavage between the two testaments might also render part the church. For are not Jehovah's Witnesses anti-Trinitarians? We therefore feel that we should most strongly advise against this transcription of YHWH in the translation of the Bible. And from this point on, most Bible translations, they did not use the name of Jehovah or Yahweh. They were commonly replaced with the title Lord. Modern translations uh, use the name Lord both for God and for Jesus. And in the New Testament there are about 100 places where there is total confusion. We cannot know whether the referent is Jesus or God. And of course the writers of the New Testament did not cause this confusion but those who removed the name of God from the scriptures. One example of this can be found in Psalm 110 of the Martin Luther version. The first verse reads, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So, which lords are meant here? Correctly translated, this verse reads as follows. Jehovah said unto my Lord, Jesus is meant here, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. As mentioned before, the name of God appears over more than 6,000 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. And uh, the more than 6,000 times the tetragram occurs in the Hebrew Scriptures, there is absolutely no hint that at some time the name should not be used anymore. And there is also no indication that the name of God should be replaced with the titles Lord or God titles that aren't exactly unproblematic. The words Lord and God are appellatives and not proper names. So whereas the name Jehovah can only refer to the Creator, God and Lord can refer to many different persons including uh, Satan and including idols for that matter. In this sense, Paul uses the title God in his second letter to the Corinthians. If now the good news we declare is in fact veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing, among whom the God of this system of things has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And also, the seemingly neutral title Lord has a disconcerting connotation, since Lord is rendered Baal in the Akkadian language of Babylon. Now, the name Baal is a Semitic word signifying Lord or Master. It is very common in the Semitic world. The Hebrews, as well as all other nations in this region, are well acquainted with it. In Mesopotamia, they would use the form Baal. The Babylonians rather said Bel, and the Canaanites, or Jews, used Baal. To which degree the term Baal was of importance even for Jews is clear when looking at the name of King David's 11th son, Beliada, 
the Lord, owner, or Baal knows. He is listed in the first book of Chronicles. Yet over time, even Jehovah was being replaced with the term Baal. And in order to prevent a mix between the Jewish and pagan religion, the commandment to not use the name Baal for God is listed in the Bible. In the scriptures written by the prophet Jeremiah, the practice of Baal worship is additionally mentioned as a reason for forgetting God's name. They are thinking of making my people forget my name by means of their dreams that they keep relating each one to the other, just as their fathers forgot my name by means of Baal. Even the churches of Christendom try to make God's name fade into oblivion. Solely Jesus is accepted as a deity. Paul's letter to the Philippians provides insight into how the relationship between Jesus and his Father is actually to be understood. I read here from the Greek text, uh, verse 9. Diokai hotheos auton hyper ypsosen kai esharisato auto to onoma to hyper pan onoma. I would translate this as uh, 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 therefore God exalted him and kindly gave him a name above all other names. Although the term name could be referring to either an actual name or a hierarchy. So Jesus, he got all authority in heaven and earth above every other name. But of course, Jehovah is the highest. There is also a difference between the two names. Jesus is never called Jehovah, but his name points to Jehovah and says, Jehovah, he is the only one that causes salvation. In the Old Testament, prophets like Joel pointed out God's sovereignty not only to Jews, and everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. The disciples of Jesus were also reminded of this Joel quote in Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. For everyone who calls on the name of God, Jehovah, will be saved. Salvation obviously seems to be strongly linked to calling upon God's name. That is what the Bible says. But where do churches stand? In a Vatican directive on the use of the name of God in the sacred liturgy from 2008, addressed to the Conference of Bishops around the world, it is stated that the Tetragrammaton should be replaced with Lord and that God's name in its diverse forms including Yahweh and Jehovah should neither be used nor uttered in the liturgy, prayers or church hymns. That is contradictory since the official Catholic Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, uses the form Yahweh. 
And some popes, who are known to have the ultimate authority in the Catholic world, use the name too. The name of God didn't just vanish on its own in the course of time. There have always been forces that have actively pursued the elimination of the name. And yet, these were not solely the enemies of the people of Israel. But even the Jews themselves, who banned the name of their own God, beginning approximately in the second century after Christ. The rabbis of the second century forbade the utterance as well as the use of the name. It was only to be used in the synagogues and then again replaced with the title Adonai, which means Lord. That is how the name slowly began to disappear and from the third century onward it more or less stopped being used, except for occasionally in written form but no longer verbally. According to what is known, even those Jews who joined the Christian movement observed the ban to not speak the name in public, since violations involved severe punishment by the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. But this rarely happened. There are only a few cases known. Recorded in the New Testament is the case of a member of the young Christian congregation of Jerusalem accused of speaking against the Jewish faith and law. Stephen, a Jew, now wants to prove that he hasn't disowned his Jewish faith. He refers to the burning bush and in all likelihood thereby mentions the name of God. But bringing up God's name while simultaneously being accused of blasphemy results in a death penalty. And in this case it means execution by stoning. Stephen was thrown outside the city and the crowd cast stones at him. He made this appeal and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then bending his knees, he cried out with a strong voice, Jehovah, do not charge this sin against them. After saying this, he fell asleep in death. Quite often, the objection is raised that the name of God isn't mentioned in the New Testament, so that Stephen could not have called out Jehovah, but rather Lord or My God, do not charge this sin against them. The question concerning the presence of God's name in the New Testament is a matter of great controversy because one could not find it in the manuscripts. Then again, the New Testament is full of quotations taken from the Old Testament in which the name was present in the form of the Tetragrammaton. When the New Testament writers quoted from the Old Testament, they either quoted from the Hebrew text or from the Greek text of the Septuagint, a translation of the Hebrew text that was started in the 3rd century Common Era. If they quoted from the Hebrew text, they came across the name and probably used it. But the name had been replaced with Kyrios, Lord, in the Greek Septuagint. So it was argued that the translators of the Septuagint, they removed the name of God and used Curios instead, and the New Testament writers followed suit. But already in 1944, this assumption was proved wrong, after papyri of the Septuagint were published under the name Fuad 266 in Cairo. In this fragment of the Septuagint, we find the name of God here, yod He vav He in Aramaic characters.
Later, so the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and here also came fragments of the Septuagint with the name. Here we have the name in Old Hebrew characters in the middle of the Greek text. The scholar Rolf Furuli therefore concludes the following. So, as a matter of fact, all the fragments of the Septuagint up to year 50 of our common era has God's name either in Aramaic script, in Old Hebrew script, or as the Greek phonetic transcription, Yao. So the argument that the New Testament writers, they used curios because the uh, Septuagint translators did so, is invalid. Even if the original scripts of the New Testament aren't available nowadays, it can be assumed, after what has been said so far, that with certain probability the name of God was used in it. Based on this assumption, some well-known translators reinserted the name of God in the New Testament, in particular in quotations from the Hebrew Scriptures. Just as Stephen probably called out God's name, it is likely that Jesus also used the name of God, at least around his disciples. Jesus and his disciples also held God's name in high esteem. For example, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, let your name be sanctified. And in his own prayer to his father, according to John chapter 17, he says that he had made manifest God's name for his followers, which means that he told them uh, the fame and purpose and everything that God's name included. So, if the name of God still cannot be found in the New Testament, then this is, on the one hand, as mentioned before, due to the replacement of the Tetragrammaton with Kyrios, Lord, and, on the other hand, due to the prohibition, which was in force at the time. The Talmud states that anyone who pronounces the name of God will have no share in the world to come. The name was also not even allowed to be brought before the Jewish Supreme Court, the so-called Sanhedrin. Is that why Jesus used terms such as power in replacement there? So the high priest said to him, By the living God I put you under oath to tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You yourself said it. Yet I say to you men, from henceforth, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest ripped his outer garments, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? In order to make the prohibition of pronouncing God's name seem justifiable, Rabbinic Judaism mainly cites the Third Commandment. You must not take up the name of Jehovah, your God, in a worthless way, for Jehovah will not leave the one unpunished who takes up his name in a worthless way. But actually, this commandment does not forbid pronouncing the name of God, since it merely prohibits associating it 
with vanities or worthless things. However, there are many passages in the Bible in which the name is used respectfully, even in everyday life. For example, in the book of Ruth. And look, Boaz came from Bethlehem and proceeded to say to the harvesters, Jehovah be with you. In turn, they would say to him, Jehovah bless you. Throughout all of Israelite history, down to the return of the Jews to their homeland after the release from Babylonian captivity, the name commonly remained in use. In the case of King David, who lived approximately 1,000 years before Christ, the name pops up hundreds of times. Jehovah is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be in fear? And we should take a look at the Ketev Hinnom inscription uh, close to Jerusalem from the year 625 before Common Era. This is, uh, uh, this is an inscription of two silver plates. And here we see the name of God at least three times here and here and here. Yevarecha Jehovah. Let Jehovah bless you. And here we also have the tetragram. So, no doubt, the name of God was freely used by people living in Israel. All the more astonishing is the explanation the Vatican provides in order to prohibit the use of God's name. As an expression of the infinite greatness and majesty of God, it was held to be unpronounceable. And hence was replaced by the title Lord. Could this be a coincidence? Millions of Christians pray not to Jehovah, but to a Lord, whose Akkadian translation is Baal. Once again, let's see what the Bible says about Baal. They are thinking of making my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name by means of Baal. And in another passage, it is written that God would bring calamity over Jerusalem because the Jewish priesthood even offered up their children to Baal. And they built the high places of the Baal in order to burn their sons in the fire as whole burnt offerings to the Baal. But the Bible gives the observant reader even more information. When Satan deceives Eve in the form of a serpent, he strictly avoids saying God's name. Bible translators found out that Satan uses the term God even though the name Jehovah is found in the text. For example, when Jesus has a discussion with Satan, Jesus solely uses Jehovah. But Satan solely uses the title God. He never uses the name even though he knows it. Satan uses the name even though he knows it. 
So the act of using the name of God is strongly bound to our relationship with God. If I love someone, I use that person's name. If I love God, I use his name. And that is something Satan does not want. The past centuries, however, have proved that the name of God could not be completely annihilated. In 1526, Martin Luther stated the following in a sermon. This name, Jehovah, Lord, belongs exclusively to the true God. And he reacted to the concealment of God's name through the Jews in his own manner. That they demand the name Jehovah shall be unspeakable. Do they not know what they are babbling? Once he finished his complete translation of the Bible based on the original languages in the year 1534, he himself, however, had also replaced the name of God with the title Lord. Nevertheless, the Reformation set up the perfect background for an astonishing renaissance of the name. Just as in biblical times, it was to serve as a protective shield against enemies, which in the 16th and 17th century happened to be represented by armies of the Counter-Reformation. Yet the divine name has spread far beyond that. The chorus of the Hebrew slaves from Verdi's opera Nabucco praises Jehovah, and even the Empress of Austria, Elizabeth, called on him. Jehovah, you created this earth too beauteous, so my soul has no reason to stay. It thirsts to see even lovelier worlds that float in the ether seas far away. Jehovah, oh, let my soul kneel on golden, luminous planets, whilst below the oceans blow past, it exultingly prays to you above, everlast. Nowadays, a change in dealing with the name seems to be indicated even among Jews. Nowadays, some Jews have decided to proclaim the name Jehovah. One example is the Karelite Nehemia Gordon, who believes that a conspiracy of silence exists regarding the name. Concerning the fate of his people, he even dares to ask the following question in his book. I had a terrifying thought. Was God not answering our prayers? because we weren't praying using his name. To the Soviet soldiers who liberated the camp and to the former delegations... The justification of this question is generally rejected in the world of politics and media, which is characterized by atheist views. 
How accurate the question regarding God and His name really is, is proven by the thousands that have called upon and praised God's name from Auschwitz and other concentration camps, the prisoners carrying the purple triangle, Jehovah's Witnesses. Their religious conviction and their exemplary behavior even moved other prisoners to join them. When they were able to leave the camp in the end, not only had their number, but also their faith increased. Because their equipment was made of God's word and psalms like this one. Jehovah is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be in fear? Jehovah is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be in dread? <laughs> 